I am a perpetual traveler through the Bible. Please join me for the next part of my journey through the scriptures. Stay as long as you like and let us together discover a bit more about the Bible. In Matthew 24, Jesus' great prophetic passage known as the Olivet Discourse, he refers to the events that will take place in the final week of years that appear in Daniel chapter 9. Now, in Daniel 9, the prophet Daniel was given a great prophecy of events that spans more than 2,000 years from his own day on into our own future. Marked out on this prophecy is a period of 70 weeks of years. 70 weeks would be 490 years. That is 70 weeks times 7 years, which is equal to 490 years. The 490 year period that Daniel said would be fulfilled began with the building of the wall of Jerusalem in the days of Nehemiah until the end of the age. Before his crucifixion, as Jesus talked with his disciples on the Mount of Olives, he told them what would happen in the period just before his second coming. In that period, he refers several times to what he calls the end of the age. This is the same final seven-year period of Daniel's prophecy that Jesus refers to when he speaks of the end of the age. This seven-year period of both Daniel's prophecy and Jesus' prophecy contains the fascinating and frightening series of events that we are currently exploring in Revelation 6 through 19. If you read about the life of Christ in the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, you will notice that almost one-third of the entire story is focused on a single seven-day period, the week leading up to the crucifixion. In the same way, 13 of Revelation's 22 chapters are focused on a single seven-year week of time, a period which comprises the end of the history of this age. This seven-year week is characterized by three series of events, the seven seals, the seven trumpets, and the seven bowls of wrath. Each of these series is divided into four and three, that is four visible and recognizable events, and three revelations of what is occurring behind the scenes, in the hidden realm of the angels, both the Lord's angels and the fallen angels, that is the realm of the Spirit. In episode 30 of the Journey Through the Scriptures, we ended the podcast talking about the first of the four horsemen of the Apocalypse, the rider on the white horse. I shared my personal conviction that this rider on the white horse is most likely the long-predicted Antichrist that Scripture speaks of in various places, who is yet to appear in these last days. Now we will move on to the other three horsemen. Revelation 6 verses 3 to 4 says, When he opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature say, Come, and out came another horse, bright red. Its rider was permitted to take peace from the earth, so that people would slay one another, and he was given a great sword. This is where the second seal is opened. This rider is easy to recognize. It is war, of course, but not war between armies. The Greek word for slay is really the word slaughter. It is a reference to civil war, or civil unrest, where mobs of people group together to attack and destroy other people whom they hate. We saw a manifestation of this during the Second World War with the genocide of the Jews by Hitler's Nazi regime. However, this event, brought on by the rider of the red horse, will be a murderous slaying of others by people unrestrained by any control. It will not stop there. It says, He was given a great sword. In the days when John wrote, they obviously did not have bombs, missiles, tanks, or any of the modern weapons of warfare. Such weapons of destruction had to be put in terms that people would understand in that day. So the major weapon of destruction was then a sword. This is a great sword, a powerful weapon of mass destruction. This might be a way of describing nuclear warfare, something that destroys enormous numbers of people. Chapters 38 and 39 of Ezekiel describe vivid descriptions of such warfare, where armies come down out of the north into the Holy Land and are decimated by what appears to be the radiation from nuclear warfare. The opening of the third seal appears in Revelation 6, verses 5 to 6. When he opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come, and I looked, and behold, a black horse, and its rider had a pair of scales in his hand. 
and I heard what seemed to be a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a denarius, and three quarts of barley for a denarius, and do not harm the oil and the wine. Most Bible scholars interpret this as widespread famine on the earth. The mention of scales symbolize food being weighed out carefully. It is in such short supply that it must be rationed. Even then, no one can buy very much because it takes a day's wages or a denarius to earn a single quart of wheat or, because it is cheaper, three quarts of barley. This would only be enough food for one person for a day. You would work all day long and all you would be able to earn at best would be enough for your own physical needs. There would be nothing for your family or for anyone else. But notice how the luxuries, the oil and the wine, are left untouched. But perhaps this is not referring to famine because in the next seal, as we will see, famine is specifically mentioned as part of that judgment. Perhaps it is not worldwide food shortages caused by drought or crop failure, but something else. What else causes terrible shortages and creates high prices so that people cannot buy adequate amounts of food? It is inflation. Economics out of control. Runaway inflation makes money worthless. That in turn brings the rigid controls over buying and selling which we find in chapter 13 when, under the reign of Antichrist, the whole world is subjected to enormously restrictive controls so that no one can buy or sell unless he has the mark, that is, the name of the beast or the number of its name. This appears in Revelation 13 verses 17. In Revelation 6 verses 7 to 8, the fourth seal is opened. When he opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature say, Come, and I looked, and behold a pale horse, and its rider's name was Death, and Hades followed him, and they were given authority over a fourth of the earth, to kill with sword, and with famine, and with pestilence, and by wild beasts of the earth. The word translated as pale is actually chloros, from which we get the word chlorine or chlorophyll. In other words, a pale green horse, like chlorine in color. This rider is named Death, and following along behind was a figure that is identified as Hades, or Hell. In other words, Death takes the body, and Hades takes the soul. There are four forms of death that are related to this attack. Firstly, the sword. The word used here in Greek is not used in the context of war, but murder, individual assault upon another. It is people taking the law into their own hands and murdering other people without any regard for justice or law. Secondly, with murder comes famine and widespread starvation. When civilization begins to crumble, the defenses of mankind against diseases are lost as well. Thirdly, there is a reference here to biological warfare, the willful spreading of diseases among people, so that they are wiped out en masse. It covers also the appearance of previously unknown diseases. The COVID-19 virus pandemic is but a shadow of what is to come. The fourth death comes from wild beasts of the earth, where humans are attacked by these predators. The scriptures say that the fourth of the earth is given over to the four attacks. It is difficult to know whether it is a geographic or a demographic division of earth. If it is geographic, then a quarter of the globe will be decimated by these terrible plagues. If it is demographic, it means a quarter of the world's population is taken. Today, that would mean the death of 1.97 billion people. These four seal judgments are all references to forces that are already work amongst us, but they will be carried into uncontrolled and unrestricted levels. So these four seals confirm God's pronounced method of making men face up to truth. How does he make us stop hiding our heads and refusing to face reality? By allowing evil to have its full power over us. Just look at what Paul says to us in his letter to the Romans in chapter 1. Therefore God gave them up in the lusts of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves. For this reason God gave them up to dishonorable passions, for their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature, and the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another, men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, 
God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. God teaches us to face up to unpleasant truths by giving us what we demand. If men want to believe a lie, then God will send the lie, the lie of the Antichrist, described as the powerful delusion by Paul. If men want to kill and destroy and refuse to see the evil of that, then God gives them over to widespread anarchy, mob rule and ultimately nuclear destruction. If men want more wealth and more luxury and higher standards of living, they are given what goes along with it, high inflation which finally makes their money worthless. These cannot be stopped because they are the inescapable consequences of the evil of mankind. There are still three seals left, and unlike the first four seals, these are not man-made disasters, but supernatural acts of God. Revelation 6 verses 9 to 11 says, When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the witness they had borne. They cried out with a loud voice, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Then they were each given a white robe and told to rest a little longer, until the number of their fellow servants and their brothers and sisters should be complete. Those were to be killed as they themselves had been. There are three more seals to look at. Only two of them appear in chapter 6. In these two, natural forces are not allowed to affect mankind, but there is something quite different. We are shown supernatural activities, God working in the midst of the judgments of the four horsemen, both for good and for evil. This is a difficult couple of verses to grasp, because it is dealing with a phenomena that is hard for us to comprehend. That is, how people can die over a period of time, yet all arrive in heaven together. This marks the difference between time and eternity. The altar mentioned here has not appeared in Revelation before this. But later references in this book will show us that we are viewing the great temple in heaven, the temple which Moses saw when he was on Mount Sinai. Moses was shown the pattern which he was to copy in the old tabernacle. He was ordered to copy it exactly as it was shown him. Other scriptures teach us that these symbolize the ultimate dwelling place of God, which is man himself. Man is the dwelling place of God. When we come to the end of Revelation, we will see that fulfilled. It is man who becomes the temple of God. These symbols are a clear image of the psychological makeup of our humanity, body, soul, and spirit, just as the tabernacle consisted of the outer court, the holy place, and the holy of holies. The group of martyrs mentioned here in Revelation 6 verses 9 to 11 is clearly linked with the great multitude in chapter 7, which we will look at later. John sees a great crowd which no man could number from every tribe, nation, and language of earth, standing before the throne, all having been killed for their testimony. This group belongs to that multitude as well, for they are given a white robe and told to wait until their brethren would also be killed. This indicates that these martyrs and those killed later, who make up the great multitude, all enter heaven at the same time. This indicates that these martyrs and those killed later, who make up the great multitude, all enter heaven at the same time. It is God's way of revealing the transfer of time into the conditions of eternity, where past and future cease to exist and only the present exists. If you have had loved ones who have died in the past, perhaps your father, your mother, grandmother or some Christian friend, you tend to think of them now as waiting in heaven for you. But this idea is giving eternity a limited characteristic of time. Do not think that heaven is an eternal continuation of the conditions of earth, where future and past are as much to be experienced in heaven as they are on earth. That is not so. Eternity is always now. In eternity, events occur when people are ready for them, not in a certain prescribed sequence. Notice the prayer that these martyrs pray. It is a call for vengeance. That is quite different from the prayer Christians are expected to pray for the enemies today. Jesus told us that we are to pray for those that hate and persecute us, and our prayer is to reflect the prayer that he prayed on the cross when he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. When Stephen, the first martyr, saw the Lord as he was being stoned, what did he pray? Lord, do not hold the sin against them. 
He was asking that his murderers be forgiven for they did not know what they were doing. That is to be the prayer of believers today for those who persecute them or take unfair advantage of them. But these martyrs under the fifth seal are not living in the days when God patiently endures the injustices of man. These are days of judgment, days when wrongdoers are being called to account, a time of vengeance. The prayers then of God's people reflect the mind of God at that time. Led of the Spirit, they pray for what God intends to do during these last days. When he opened the sixth seal, I looked and behold, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth, the full moon became like blood, and the stars of the sky fell to the earth as the fig tree sheds its winter fruit when shaken by a gale. The sky vanished like a scroll that has been rolled up, and every mountain and island was removed from its place. It is a vivid description of chaos in nature. Again in Matthew 24 verses 29 to 30, Jesus describes the same event. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of the heaven will be shaken. Then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. These six seals have carried us almost to the very end of the whole seven-year period. We have been swiftly moving through this dramatic period. After the Great Tribulation, there will be a great upheaval of nature through some cosmic event. Perhaps it is the approach of an undetected planet like an asteroid, or a comet, or a rogue star that will disturb the gravity of the Earth. The world's volcanoes will begin to erupt. There will be great earthquakes, much larger than the ones that we have ever experienced, and the stars will appear to be falling from the sky. The darkening of the sun and the moon will probably result from the ashes and dust caused by these phenomena. In Luke 21 verses 25 to 27, Jesus describes this time as well vividly. And there will be signs in sun and moon and stars, and on the earth distress of nations in perplexity, because of the roaring of the sea and the waves, people fainting with fear and with foreboding of what is coming on the world. For the powers of the heavens will be shaken, and then they will see the Son of Man coming in the cloud with power and great glory. It will be a time of terror and anguish throughout the earth. What will be the effect of this on the people? John now sees the final scene under the sixth seal in Revelation 6 verses 15 to 17. Then the kings of the earth and the great ones and the generals and the rich and the powerful and every one, slave and free, hid themselves in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains, calling on the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him who is seated on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of their wrath has come, and who can stand? Who can stand? That is the question left hanging in the air. Of course, no one can stand. It is the end of civilization as we know it. All people who have not yet believed in Christ, who have refused his offer of grace, are the subjects of this terrible catastrophe and cry out in desperate fear. The prophet Isaiah repeats this attitude of mankind on that day in Isaiah 2 verses 21 and also in Isaiah 26 verses 10 when he writes, On that day mankind will cast away their idols of silver and their idols of gold, which they made for themselves to worship, to the moles and to the bats, to enter the caverns of the rocks and the clefts of the cliffs, from before the terror of the Lord, and from the splendor of his majesty when he rises to terrify the earth. If favor is shown to the wicked, he does not learn righteousness. In the land of uprightness he deals corruptly and does not see the majesty of the Lord. Those who refuse to believe have reached the stage where they cannot believe and will not repent and pray to the Lord for salvation. Instead, they are driven by a terrible fear and pray to the rocks to destroy them. It is a strange phenomenon that every unbeliever is convinced in his own heart that death is somehow an escape into oblivion. Somehow, they think they can escape the terrible consequences of their evil by dying. This is why many people commit suicide. They believe they are escaping their problems, that there will be no consequences beyond death. But the Word of God assures us that this is not true, because in Hebrews 9 verses 27 the Scriptures declare, it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment. 
As believers, why are we told these terrible truths? If we belong to the Lord now and are members of His body, the true church, we know that we will not be part of the scene. This is the great promise we have heard several times in Revelation up to this point. This whole scene is specifically sent to the seven churches of Asia to read and understand. So why are we told? It is not only to make us more impassioned in our witness, it is also intended to show us where the world's forces and movements of today are going to end up. We are told this so that we can recognize the evil while it still looks good, and so be able to judge what to cling to and what to reject. Jesus tells us the whole truth in one verse in John 3 verses 36 when he says, Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son will not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. The reason for these judgments is human pride. Isaiah states in Isaiah 2 verse 17, And the haughtiness of men shall be humbled, and the lofty pride of men shall be brought low, and the Lord alone will be exalted on that day. We all have this terrible desire within us to be in charge, to be in control of our lives and of other people's lives, to run everything, to be the center of our own little universe and to judge everything as to whether it pleases us or displeases us. This is the pride of man. Only God's grace can humble it. The sight of God's Son dying in our place ought to make us see the evil of our hearts. But if grace does not humble us, ultimately judgment will. If we are faithful to the scriptures, we must recognize that the day is coming when the wrath of God must be poured out on the unrighteousness of men. And it is to that day that we have come. Let us be sure that none of us has an evil heart of unbelief. This is David Wiles, your fellow traveler in Christ, and this has been the Journey Through the Scriptures podcast, episode 31.